Today on Lina TV, we are going to be up close and personal with one of the masquerades in Niger State. Our guest today on the interview is an educationist by excellence, an astute politician, a philanthropist, a game changer, a loving husband, and a dedicated father and grandfather, as well as a mentor to many young politicians in Niger State and beyond. Our guest today is a pioneer of leadership, servant leadership initiatives. It will interest you to know that our guest is not only a game changer, but a traditional value promoter. This has earned him several titles of, across the three geopolitical zones in Niger State and Nigeria in general. Amongst his numerous titles, he is the Sodengi Nupe, he is the Badogosian Age, Sardaunan Arewa, and the Talbom Mina. I know by now, I am sure you have an idea of who we are meeting with today. Join us as I welcome to the interview on Lina TV, the national honor holder of the OON and CON. He is none other but the chief servant of Niger State, Dr. Moazu Babangida Aliu Talbamina. You're welcome to Lina TV. You're Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here too. So Danatori, we have, um, <laughs> he chuckled when I called him the masquerade, <laughs> but he is indeed the masquerade. Of course, when we have somebody like uh, the chief servant, uh, always around us, it gives us so much joy. However, our chief servant, sir, I will just put this straight to you because each time we see you, you're always gallant. What has been the secret, sir? Well, the secret is being satisfied with whatever position you find yourself. If you understand, our belief system is that that which God has promised to give you, he will give you. Mm. But he said also that he has another, if you will, bank where you can ask for more. But most importantly is to be satisfied with whatever condition you find yourself because he never sleeps. Mm -hmm. So when you have that, nothing will shake you. Nothing will make you uh, or disturb you. And you will be happy with yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. So th this, this belief system, which in our own religion we call Iman, Mm -hmm. to know that you have faith in your God and to always know that uh, he will not forget you. I think that is what encourages one. And also the background, the opportunities that he had given us in terms of education, in terms of exposure, both administrative, political, and other, and other means that he has endowed us with this. Uh, will make you feel very happy with yourself. Not proud, but at least feeling contented. All right, Chief Servant, um, after eight years of your tenure as governor of Niger State, two term, four years, um, a lot of people would have thought uh, by now you you will remain aside or you step aside as a politician, just remain uh, a godfather to everybody, but you still, you are very, very active. After eight years, how would you rate your administration mm. all through the eight years? I mean, self-assessment now. No, I, I don't think I, I need any self-assessment on that. By the time I came as a governor, I was really prepared for the job. I had grown from the system from level seven to permanent secretary at the federal level. And I've been posted to various ministries, including one that uh, the administration of that place was virtually like a state, the FCT. So one has learned a lot. You know all the system. You know where to get your intelligence. You know who to talk to. And you know what is expected of you from the people. So coming to Niger State was like an icing on the cake. And uh, maybe without saying, but I hear pe many people say that there had not been a government like ours 
since the creation until to date. I only pray that we will have somebody that will surpass us in terms of doing good for Niger State. Mm. So. Uh, Chief Evans, uh, there's one laudable project, uh, program that you had during your tenure, the World Development Project. Yes. That was very, very laudable because I remember vividly at the time, the World Bank had to send the officials to come down to Niger State to understudy, I mean, to see how we you were doing are it, proceeding. Yeah. Um, I want you to give um, an advice to those who are currently in government, given the fact that it was laudable and what they should start doing. The fact that uh, when you have a government taking over uh, the predecessor, it is believed that its government is uh, continuity. But successive governments have come and uh, they neglected some of these uh, laudable projects we initiated. So what would be your advice to incoming governments or the current government at the moment? I told you about preparation. People from outside see governance as a simple thing. It is not so. I remember when we were inducting the new governors that have come in, and uh, some of us even said that because of what you go through, Sometimes you even lose yourself. And I said openly in the, in, the, in the seminar that there was a time when I had a one week, I didn't, I didn't realize I was not uh, a man. Mm. Only when I go urinate and that's when I realized I had something different. And that was because of the pressure, because of the stress involved, and because of the expectations of the people. So if you are not prepared for this job, you will be so overwhelmed, or maybe underwhelmed, that uh, you will not be able to do much. And we have seen examples of that in some states. But I'm happy that the current government that we have in Niger State, at least he had the exposure of 12 years in the National Assembly which had introduced him not only to the administrative, they, you know, they have the committee system, they have other, in fact, if not for so-called zoning, mm. he would have been the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So I believe that at least psychologically and experience-wise that he's prepared for the job. And I'm happy to hear that he is likely to adopt the system of the word development, but let me carry you back a little. Why did that issue come about? I went around both during the campaign and during thank you visits and co, and I went to many villages where they were not even aware where, whether there is a government or no government because they never had anybody working in the system. They never saw a government official coming to them. They never enjoyed anything about government, no uh, pipe of water, no nothing, virtually. And I felt that there is a need for the fourth tier of government. Federal, state, local government, and then the word development. In Niger State, we have 274 words. And if you covered that, you will be able to cover probably more than three quarters of the people of Niger State. Hmm. Unfortunately, as a leader, no matter what you do, there are still certain people that may not be covered. And that's why when somebody was asking whether because I'm, I'm flying by background, but I have become Gua Hausa now, <laughs> you know, Guari Hausa, so uh, that I paid too much attention to the flying. And my, my argument was, Look, these people are not enjoying anything about government. In fact, mm -hmm. what you think you have done for them, like the roads, for them is like a killer road. Mm -hmm. Because when they are passing, vehicles will be pushing their cows no, down. And somebody who pays, who probably sells about five cows to be able to go to Mecca, mm -hmm. and then you make him go to suffer there. I said, no, it's not possible. But those are some of the things that we were doing touching every facet of governance and spending money in that direction that many people thought the government had too much money. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And when they came, I'm sure they found something different. Mm -hmm. That when, once you are experienced, you will be able to govern very well. You will be able to understand what needs to be done. And uh, without too much exposure uh, to government finances, mm -hmm. you know, you should be able to understand what the people want. And that's why we, in, in addition to all this, we introduce what we call Jama'a Forum. Mm -hmm. We go to the villages to hear people, to hear their own cries. Don't sit in, your, in the government house and think you know what the people want. And, and by the way, don't overgeneralize. Mm -hmm. Because what may be needed, for example, in Shiroro local government, may not be what will be needed in Mokwa local government mm -hmm. or in Mashegu local government. Mm -hmm. Because you need to appreciate that the needs could be different. While Shiroro may be looking for security, Mashegu may be looking for education. Mm -hmm. So you need to appreciate that so that you know how to concentrate your governance and how also to disperse your funding in what needs to be done. But I was so happy with the, with the fact that God gave us a chance to introduce that word development. Yeah. Because I faced a lot of opposition that many people didn't know. Yeah. Uh, opposition from people who probably felt that the chief servant is too wise for them to control. Yeah. And uh, they were doing everything possible. I went to Supreme Court more than three times. I went to other courts and co. All I know that sponsored by people that uh, were outside the system and co. And I'm aware uh, that, uh, in fact, some people wanted, even after governance, they wanted to make sure that they bury us completely, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, God in his infinite mercy has not allowed that to happen. So, but importantly, to, uh, during the election of 2011, the opposition, which is within my party, not even outside my party, mm -hmm. Within my party, what probably saved that election was the word development. Mm. Because mm. all the words at least have been, has been carried along and people said, no, what has he done wrong? But believe me, uh, the election of 2011 was tougher than, uh, than the election of 2007. Mm. No. Because we have been able to mobilize the people mm -hmm. to appreciate and now to expect from their government what the government has to do for them. We introduced free education mm -hmm. from primary school. In fact, we extended it to secondary school, not just junior secondary school. Mm -hmm. We made sure every student in every university or tertiary institution was paid his scholarship. In fact, I went around anywhere where we had up to student of 100 or 200 we give them buses and some money to open what you can call this uh, a little shop so that they can make money and be able to move around. Yeah. So, people were happy. IBBU uh, was so strong at that time. And thank God, all the institutions were okay. In fact, if you notice, most of the new buildings in, in the College of Education uh, were during our time yes. because we were able to speak to, uh, well, Ted Fund now, but uh, we were able to speak to them and they came helping and there was a, a, an excellent provost yeah. in the school, uh, Rashid, that he was able to get many things done. Mm. And we wanted to build University of Education there so that while it is still producing NCE teachers, it will also produce uh, BA education, B ed education, and co. Why? Because out of our 19 northern states, none has up to 50% qualified teachers. Hmm. And without qualified teachers, you can't go beyond the qualification of, or the, the, uh, of your teachers. So we wanted to make sure that we produce enough teachers. And I was happy also when uh, I wrote my application for the university. Uh, the federal government at that time, the government of Jonathan also saw it and wanted to create six uh, universities of education. Yeah. Unfortunately, when Buhari came, he killed the matter. Mm. So 
I, I hope that the new government that is coming in, and now with the private universities coming yeah. up, uh, that things will catch up. Mm -hmm. We can do Nigeria of a population of 200 million plus can do with more than 500 universities. Mm -hmm. And the universities don't have to be too large. Any small uh, university or specialized university that will concentrate on particular uh, production of particular uh, specialization, that will be excellent. And so let's continue and see what will happen. Uh, if things become difficult for the states and for the federal government, there are many ways to kill a cat than by chucking it. Mm -hmm. Probably this is the time for the federal government to start looking at alternatives of how to fund education. Mm -hmm. uh, federal government probably, in fact, we used to say that it does not have, should not be involved in uh, secondary school education in the primary school education but we knew at the time when we had this federal government colleges and the schools. unity schools and co uh, I, I believe that we have now gone beyond that mm -hmm. and that the concentration now for the government is really to become a regulator mm -hmm. and to give incentives for the private for the private sector to get very involved in uh, provision of education in the country, whether elementary, secondary, and uh, uh, funding. I haven't read the law establishing the loan system, but I'm aware of the loan system in the US, hmm. where you get the loan to pay your school fees, and you have a, a moratorium period uh, when you finish to be able to pay. And I'm aware that uh, the government in the U.S. sometimes will just wake up and say they had, uh, yeah. you know, written yeah. off the the loans. I think the government should come clean to let people understand those who should be qualified directly for the loan. But it should be open to everybody. But at least the emphasis should be for the indigent students. Yeah. And why I'm so encouraged that we must pay attention to indigent students was when at the Saamodi Bello Memorial Foundation we sponsor every year about 200 students uh, in the various universities. Mm. The first graduates, uh, graduates of our program, out of the 200, 48 percent were first class. Mm. Oh. There was nobody with a third class. Oh, wow. In fact, only about two or three had uh, second class lower. Oh, wow. So I believe anybody uh, given the right uh, incentive and the right foundation will be able to do That's more. Right, yeah. But you know, those people, if we had not picked them, probably they would never have been in school. That's true. Then the other issue that I think we should be concerned is that we are producing people without work to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe at the time that uh, many uh, universities, the older ones, Ibad and ABU and Suka, were there, the production was for civil servants first, for the colonial officers, and then later on for independence. But now, there is the states and the federal government cannot provide work for the number of people that are graduated. Mm. And so it means we must look at our curriculum. If the curriculum was to produce administrators and teachers, what will be our new curriculum now? At least, I'm happy that many of the universities now uh, are involved with entrepreneurship yeah. and uh, people have been taught Key what to do. Yeah. And then the emphasis, I believe, every university should be able to do research and find out what does the market want. Mm -hmm. If the market says, oh, this time we're looking for communicators, uh, then mass communication and other areas will be emphasized. Yeah. No, we are looking for judges. Then it means we emphasize the oh. law schools and other places. No, 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 we are looking for medical people, you know. So these are the ways that other people develop. And universities also will concentrate on areas that they will be able to 
produce more. There are universities in the U.S. that they will say at no time would the population of our university be more than 1,500 students. At no time. So in other words, as they admit, the population of the students will always be 1,500. But then there are universities, because of the campuses that they have opened, like the uh, NYU, that New York University, mm. that has probably more than half a million to a million students yeah. in the various campuses and co. Uh, I remember also the university that I attended had other campuses in other towns for the undergraduates but for the graduates are concentrated in one place and mm. so we need to appreciate and understand that and we also need to know what does Nigeria need now what do we need as Nigerians what does the country need to move forward and then tailor our curriculum towards that but we cannot go back or we cannot continue with the old curriculum and believe that we will develop. No, we mm. cannot. Chief Seven, sir, uh, it's very good you've uh, touched some of the questions we wanted to ask. Oh. However, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. seem to have an uh, intuitive in 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 uh, knowledge of some yeah. of our... Yeah, before yes. we came. But quickly, let me, let me just... Um, okay. I want to um, highlight on some of the points he has um, he had raised. And this is a clarion call to the government of Niger State. You know, um, this is the reason why we need elder statesmen in places where things matter, you understand. The World Development Project, please, we are, we are, I don't know if we have to plead that they should pay attention to see if they can go back to the drawing board. Because this is more as far as I'm concerned, it's more like um, a grassroots project. project that has b direct bearing on the people. So I, I just wanted to, to please yeah, plead with the state, yeah, <laughs> on the state, the Niger state government, to please listen to this point. And thank you very much, Selin Moses Akali, our chief servant. Uh, uh, you mentioned most of the things we, or some of the things rather, uh, the educational aspect. We remember uh, during your tenure, we had uh, students who uh, were preparing for either NECO or WAEK, mm -hmm. and the government of the day took up their uh, registration the payment, fees. Yeah. Yes. When I came, what was the secret? And uh, I mean, how what would was you, the intention? The intention. Yeah. When I arrived, two thousand and seven, I discovered that both WAEK and NECO refused to release the result of some students. And after I investigated, I discovered the majority of them were really in no position to pay. To pay. So which means their result would never have been released. Mm -hmm. And which means they wasted their time because without the evidence that they have been to this and they have passed this examination, there is no way they could go anywhere. So I said, uh, after looking at it and understanding that the major problem was not the fault of the students but more or less because we have not been paying attention to even know what's happening in the state i looked at it and say you cannot segregate because you cannot say oh so 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 father uh, can pay therefore you will not pay for him i said okay let's pay for everybody mm. Mm. and uh, i realized after we started that people were paying attention to going to school too, yes very you well. know and uh, up to the time I left, I paid for the eight years period that I was there, both That's for Nico and Waiek. And in addition to that, I discovered at the time I came that uh, Federal University of Technology in Mena, we were third in terms of the intake. Mm. Uh, Kogi and Kwara were ahead of us. Yeah. So I also went to the university and asked why uh, a university in Mena that Kogi and Kwara will be ahead of us. And they told me. So we agreed. We entered into agreement with them. I was paying 70 million naira per annum for them to train some of my students to be able to qualify 
for the examination mm. and to be admitted. Mm. Oh, wow. And after about two, three years, mm. we came first.